Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, as it so happened, my uh, car broke down this last week. I was in the shop. I called Bob and asked him if he could give me a ride to church. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. He asked me if I'm ready for it today, and I said, Yep, I've got my 10 pages of notes here ready to go. <laughs> Paul or Bob gave me this look, or just kind of wondered. Yeah, I think he thought I was going to try and imitate Paul in Acts 20 and speak till midnight, but uh, I promise you I won't, <laughs> I won't go that long. Um, because I heard there is a big game on today, and you know, you see all the ads leading up to this, and they say things like, you know, get your snacks for the big game, or enter this contest to win tickets to the big game on Sunday. So I looked at my uh, program guide on TV, and there is definitely the big game this afternoon. It's the uh, Atlanta Hawks versus the Boston Celtics on, in, on the NBA. So, um, <laughs> oh, oh. Come on. <laughs> but I guess there, there is one other game. And of course, we all know that the Super Bowl is on today. Um, for me, it has some good and bad memories. Super Bowl really stands out. And so when Bob asked me if I wanted to preach, I said, well, why not Super Bowl Sunday? Um, the bad, and this is something, I, I wish Polly was here. I have such amazing respect for Polly because one, she's been faithful for so long. And just talking to her, she's a Buffalo Bills fan, is that right? Yeah. And I'm originally from Minnesota, so I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan. We have this in common that both teams have gone to the Super Bowl four times and lost all four <laughs> times. So we have this connection back and forth, um, you know, and you know, <laughs> it's not a good thing, but at least we can laugh about it. Minnesota, in fact, you can get a t-shirt and it's purple like the Vikings color and, and it says hashtag just one before I die. <laughs> I don't get one of those put on. So, uh, you know, back in the 70s, they were really successful, but they kept losing Super Bowls anyway. And the other, but the other thing, there's a good side to the whole thing because the very first time I came to church, or at least uh, Church of Christ, was Super Bowl Sunday, 1989. I had just met this woman via phone. I never knew her before. And we were part of a, an organization. We were trying to get a, an alumni group set up. And I said, hey, how would you like to come to this alumni meeting we're going to have? And she goes, no, I, I really can't. But we're having to bring your neighbor day in church this Sunday. Would you like to come? And I said, yeah, sure. And so that was the first time I stepped into a Church of Christ was Super Bowl Sunday, 1989. So um, it does, Super Bowl Sunday does have some both good and bad memories for me. And uh, so long story short on that, I came to church. Six months later, I got baptized. And uh, I'd love to say it's been an easy road since then, but we all know it goes up and down. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 12. And if you want to follow along your Bible or on your phone, you can, or if you want to listen, that's fine too. I'm sorry, I don't have the PowerPoint slides. I, I do work in tech support, but I haven't figured out how to do the PowerPoint yeah. slides. So, so we'll I'll start out in Hebrews chapter 12 starting in verse one, and it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything off that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its chain, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, keep in mind, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Now, if you watch the Super Bowl, I'm going to kind of go back and forth and use some analogies here. If you watch the Super Bowl today, there is, there is a great cloud of witnesses watching that game, either in the stands or on TV or on your personal computer device. But there's going to be a great cloud of witnesses watching that game. How much more great is our cloud of witnesses that watch us from heaven? The angels... God and Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I haven't studied this out enough to know, you know, those who have passed before us, I don't know if they're able to see us or not, but no matter what, we've got a great cloud of witnesses that are watching over us. And now some facts about today's game. It's the biggest TV event of the year. More snacks are sold on this day than any other day. There are more beverages consumed. And again, there's that great cloud of witnesses and uh, it's just a day where everyone's all fired up and, and you know, see what's going on. Now, there's some, some similarities between the game and our spiritual walk. The first one is determination. Determination is so important in either one of those. Now, we heard Paul preach or read the scripture this morning. And we are called in such a way as to win the prize. 
We have to go into, uh, we're called to go into strict training. We are called to run with purpose. We don't want to shadow box. We don't want to just box that shadow on the wall. We, are, we need to train to hit the enemy hard because the enemy is coming after us, whether you realize it or not. And you need to make your body a slave. Don't be a slave to your body. It is so easy to get caught up in everything in this world today. But the Bible says, make your body a slave. And think about the most successful athletes. They go to the gym or the field first before anybody else gets there. They're the last to leave. And for them, success doesn't come easy. There's discipline involved. There's hard work involved. And the prize goes to the one best prepared. Now, keep in mind the difference between sports and us. We're not trying to earn a reward. Jesus already did that for us. But we're doing it because we have a reward. A reward that's greater than anything we've ever experienced on this earth. You know, athletes do it for an earthly crown. A crown that won't last. We do it because we love God. And why do we love God? Because he loved us first. Second uh, Timothy chapter 2. It talks about no one... Serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. You have to compete according to the rules. Now, have you watched? The Olympics have been on too. I don't know. Anybody been watching the Olympics? Um, it's going on right now. Now, I don't know if you've been watching the news as well, but there is a Russian skater who now has been accused of doping, and that may affect her. I don't know all the details on it, but she took a medication that's normally used for the heart, but can also enhance performance. And so um, Olympic athletes, and all athletes for that matter, have rules that they have to follow or they can be disqualified. Um, but you know, most athletes don't do it because of rules, don't compete because of rules, they do it because of the love of the sport. Now likewise, we as Christians, aren't here just to follow a set of rules. We are here because we love God. And we do have a few rules, of course. Uh, rules are you have to repent of your sins, you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and we're called to love God and love others. Uh, those are the main rules we would follow. But again, we don't, because we're, we don't do it because we're told to do it. We do it because we love God and we want to follow him. And if you, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, uh, there's a little bit of a, a reason they talked about it there. One of the best places to see why we love God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, now against such thing, these things, there is no law. There's really no rules there. If you follow these things, if you're loving and joyful and peaceful, if you're kind, if you're good, if you're faithful, that gets rid of most of the laws, most of the rules, allows you to live a life of peace with God. So, uh, you know, we're not looking just at the laws. We're looking at, we're not looking at rules. We're looking at how we love God. But we must prepare, just as athletes cannot go into a game unprepared. So you think about when the Broncos had victories in the Super Bowl, you know, the two quarterbacks come to mind are John Elway and Peyton Manning. And think of if when they became part of the team, they just said, well, I made it. I'm just going to sit back and relax. And yeah, when it's game time, I'll go out there and I'll play. But I can worry about it otherwise. You know, how do you think they would have done? Definitely not as good as they, they did. Of course, they were very successful. They wouldn't have been around very long. But likewise, we're called to prepare. Again, just not out of obligation, but out of love. You know, a good way to do that through prayer and reading your Bible. Um, in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1, Jesus talked about preparation. And it's important to remember that being ready is a good thing. Jesus said, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil and jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time coming. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. 
Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, it may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. So what's the key thing there? We need to keep watch. We are never standing still in our relationship with God, because since there's two forces, good and evil, God and the devil, we're either drawing closer to him or falling away from him. You know, it just doesn't happen overnight that someone falls away. Someone just doesn't wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore. I mean, there may be a few, but most of the time, it doesn't happen that way. And Hebrews chapter 2 makes that plain, um, that we must pay the most careful attention, therefore, for what we do, so that we do not drift away. That's how people fall away from God. It's slowly. Satan knows how to get into your life and work slowly. Uh, I don't need to read the Bible today. Or I just don't feel like praying today. You know, and then maybe that picks up a little more, a little more. And then before too long, uh, I don't really need to be in church. What do I need to be around Christians for? I, I'm a Christian myself. I, I don't need them, you know. And that's how it goes. So we need to always be careful because that drifting is so subtle. And we don't want that to happen. You know, one of the things I appreciate about this church is the fact we have people like Bob and Bill who are our elders. And they watch over this flock very carefully. And they love you guys so much. And then that comes, comes across in all of you as well. If you have leaders that love the flock, the flock's going to be a lot more loving. If you don't, then that creates its own set of problems. So I'm really appreciative of the leaders that we have here. And I'm appreciative of all of you, too, because I've been coming to church consistently here for a couple of years. I was part of another church before then. And you've all just made me feel welcome. Thank you so much for that. So it's important to keep our eyes on the goal. Now, there's 32 teams in the NFL, 14 teams Make the playoffs that start in January. Now, a little over a month later, there's just two teams left, and only one of them will win the prize. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, I would say the Super Bowl of the Old Testament would be David and Goliath. And we're going to go now to First, uh, First Samuel chapter 17 to talk about those two. Where it was the Philistines versus the Israelites in, I don't want to make light of it, but it was a big game there. Now, Goliath stood nine feet, nine inches tall. Very intimidating, you know. What if uh, someone almost 10 feet tall came up to you and said, you're going to die? It would be a bit, yeah, you'd be a little intimidated, I'm sure. Now, and think about, we all have Goliaths in our lives, from a metaphorical standpoint, anyway. What are some of the Goliaths that we face? Cancer, sickness, loneliness. There's other hurts. Even Satan himself comes at you like Goliath. <clears throat> but like football or any other sport, we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. We will never be cut from the team as long as we're faithful. We just need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Um, we'll, we'll look at 1 Samuel in just a second. But Hebrews 12, starting in verse 1, says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders from the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Key thing is there, don't grow weary and don't lose heart. Now going back to 1 Samuel, starting at verse 32, it says, David said to Saul, 
Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and be with you. Talk about a man of faith. David has spent his, his life up to this point preparing for this battle. He didn't know it was going to be about this particular moment, but God definitely knew. So today, what Goliaths are you fighting in your own life? How, and how has God prepared you to fight? Because we are in a spiritual battle for our lives. There is no guarantee just because you're in church today that you will be in heaven after Jesus comes back. That's why we need each other to help each other and lift each other up. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Do you see the war there? He, Jesus brings out both sides. One side to steal, kill, and destroy. The other side gives you life, and you can have it to the full. Now, going back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 38. <laughs> Excuse me. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a, cord, a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Paul or to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. David realized he didn't need all the armor and protection that he got from Saul. He went with a shepherd's bag, five smooth stones, and a sling. And while we want to make sure that we have everything we need to fight the enemy, sometimes it just comes down to faith in God. Um, and just a sidestep going uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Starting with verse 3, it says, For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not, not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now going back to 1 Samuel, verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy glowing with, a, with health and handsomeness, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. <coughs> David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you with the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. It's quite a bit of confidence there, I have to say. We want people to know that God is all-powerful. Our devotion to him will help the world to see to whom we belong. And remember, the battle is the Lord's. We just have to stay faithful, knowing that we will go through trials here on earth. Some of those trials get pretty, pretty nasty. You agree? For me, they have it. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 48. 
As the Philistines moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Think about that. His whole army. This man, almost 10 foot tall, and David struck him down with a sling and a stone. Remember, earlier in the story, I said David picked up five stones. That was four more than he needed. Think about that. The first stone killed Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, verse 51 says, David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw their hero was dead, they turned and ran. All of a sudden, this team of Philistines, who were so confident that they were just going to wipe out the Israelites, just like that, how quickly the tables turned. They ran away like a bunch of cowards. James 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He doesn't just walk away. He flees, just like the Philistines did. As long as you submit yourself to God and resist the devil. In verse 52 of 1 Samuel 17, it continues, Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ephraim. Their dead were strewn along the Sharae road to Gath and Ephraim. Okay, so all of a sudden, now the Israelites got their confidence after being scared for so long. You know, it's like when you're behind in a game by a couple of touchdowns with just a couple of minutes left, and you go on a scoring binge and end up beating the opponent. And that's when you see a lot of hugs and high fives, both on the field and on the sidelines. You know, you can bet the Israelites are doing the same thing. Is this a little off, and I'm going to... Uh, Go off another path for a little bit. Have any of you in here ever heard of the Heidi game in the NFL? <coughs> this goes back a long ways. Uh, I'm showing my age here. Back in, uh, it's been about 50 years or so, um, and it was the Oakland Raiders. They were playing, I believe, either the New York Jets or the Giants. And back then, games were shorter, there were less commercials, and um, one of the teams was up by two touchdowns. And NBC, which was carrying the game, was running into a time crunch because they had another program scheduled to start at 6 o'clock that night. It was sponsored by Timex. And they were almost out of time. And so the executives made the decision, well, this team's up by two touchdowns. We're just going to cut the game with less than two minutes left and go to this movie. It's called Heidi. In those next two minutes, after they quit showing the game, the other team came back and beat whoever. I don't remember which one won, but it just shows it's not over till it's over. And that's the same with us. You may be down. You may be struggling. There may be sin in your life or just temptation that you feel you can't overcome. You may feel like it's almost over, but it doesn't matter because even in the last two minutes, things can change dramatically. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 53 and 54. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. So David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. He put the Philistine weapons in his own tent. David knew from the very beginning that the battle belonged to the Lord. We go through lots of trials. The enemy, he's definitely a tough opponent. They even seem unbeatable. But just remember, the battle belongs to the 